to introduce the Leonard Mary lecture to be delivered by uh, Carl Bildt, his CFR co-chair. I was asked to talk about him relying on my personal impressions as well as Swedish-Estonian relationship. Now, in around five minutes that I have for that, that's a huge task. Um, Swedish-Estonian relationship goes quite some way back. I think if, if Lennart Meri were here today, he probably, I suspect he would put the starting point into 8214 BC, when the Baltic ice lake broke through to Atlantic Ocean in central Sweden, called, a place called Billingen. And that caused much of Estonia to raise from underneath the sea. So it's all because of them that it's us gathered here today and not some fish and, and, and octopus. And also my own relationship with Carl has now survived for more than one decade. I, I think I first saw him in June 1994 when he landed in Baldiski with his helicopter to discuss something about the troop withdrawal. I remember it very clearly because I was tremendously impressed by the helicopter. Then we first talked around the decade later when I interviewed him as a journalist. Mm. Mart Lahr, our former prime minister, had promised to fix me an interview with Margaret Thatcher. And when one day he gave me a call and said, listen, I didn't manage Thatcher, but would you like to have Carl Bildt instead? And I said, mm, I don't know, okay. But by the time we had finished, I, I, I had understood that that was actually a, a very good deal. And then I would see in the context of that conference that I was organizing and he would come as a guest. And he was an easy guest because he was never demanding and self-important. And then he was a difficult guest because he was so busy. There were many, so many demands on his time that resulted in a complicated schedule that he always kept often for longer than was convenient for me. And now our paths crossed in the circles of ECFR. So, given that there is a lot to say, I actually want to mention just two things that matter to me in the context of today. And one was the way Carl as Prime Minister made Sweden the country that shaped Western policy on the Baltic states. There is an amazing book written about it, by the way, by Lars Fruden, who is sitting right here. And what they did, Carl made himself the best expert on the Baltic states. He sent his people to all three countries to be the best informed Western politician on, on the matters here. It was policy based on competence, not declarations. And that was what allowed Sweden to amplify its voice far more than could have been the case otherwise. They directed the policy of big European countries as well as the United States, and that was when they were not even members of the European Union themselves. And secondly, another feature of the same policy relationship between promise, what you promise and what you do. Some Estonians have told me how Carl was actually disappointing. Uh, Bill told them allegedly that, you know, if Russia attacks Estonia, we cannot defend you. And then in the book that Lars wrote, I read how in 1993, in the spring of 1993, they had an exercise in some bunker inside some rock uh, outside Stockholm discussing exactly that. What could they do? How could they react if Russia were to invade the Baltics? Because for them, as they saw it themselves, the option of staying neutral had become untenable. So to me, that's the classic case of policy that's based on competence rather than declarations and policy that on the promises and they were deliverers. And so I decided to use that small occasion here to try to somewhat repopularize that old-fashioned and forgotten 
way of policy making, which I think can be amazingly effective. And another thing, I have always been impressed by Carl's curiosity about the world, events, people, what's behind this or that. And it's needless to say that that makes him a more interesting human being and probably better at his various jobs. But I think it's also very important in today's European politics. That's slightly complicated to even talk about and a bit scary, but mm, in this corner of the world, it's really hard to accept that end of a history was not really end of history because we wanted to be the end, because that was a really happy end for us. So we, we want it to last. We, we are trying to cling to it. We are trying to sanction, regulate, and punish life itself to make it come back, because we liked it. And that makes me a bit scared, because I don't think that can be done. I think you need to adapt. I think you need to take your views and values and adapt them for a different world. I found a Leonard quote to support it. We are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. I think that's what you need. You need to adapt and change to, to remain there. And for that you need minds that are open and adaptable. And I think Carl has one of them. Someone wrote that his mind is a mix of real politic and ideal, ideal politic, meaning that it stays firm to principles while accepting real life facts. And I think that's exactly the sort of mind we need to shape our future policies. Carl. Thanks, Caudry. Highly embarrassing, uh, much exaggerated, and um, it brought me back memories of things that happened in the past. I'm not going to tell the entire story about that helicopter journey, but it is an interesting one that tells quite a lot of what happened then. And that was, as we know, 30 or more than 30 years ago. Now it's these days, it's 30 years since Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania regained their independence. It was indeed a dramatic time. In retrospect, for those who weren't there at the time, it all looks fairly straightforward or even harmonious. But in reality, it was nothing of the sort. There were fierce political battles between the red-brown forces of the past and the forces of the future waving back and forth in Russia. There were nationalist passions in the Caucasus, in the Balkans, resorting even to arms. And there was serious concern over the fate of the huge arsenals of nuclear weapons. In all of this, the personality of Leonard Meary was uh, supremely confident. He wasn't, as has been pointed out previously during the conference, he wasn't a man of politics or of power. He didn't really care. He was a man of ideas, of historical perspective, and of deep cultural convictions. For him, Russia was Alexander Pushkin. Europe was Immanuel Kant. And Estonia was, of course, home. A home that was part of this Europe of the Enlightenment, and that sought to live in, as he said, peace and happiness with Russia. The journey of Estonia as well as Latvia and Lithuania, since then has been uh, truly remarkable. The wild reform rodeo days of Matla set it on a course of success that few at the time could actually envisage. And the country was lucky not only to have the outstanding personality of Lennart Meri during his years as president of Estonia during the somewhat turbulent 1990s, but then the subsequent also the different, but also bright, shining personalities of Tomas Ilves and Shasti Kalurad, Kalurad, making Estonia known and admired throughout much of the world. It's been, in every single respect, a rather astonishing story. Then, 30 years ago, 
was a period of huge dreams as well as, as I said, profound dangers. The dream of a Europe whole and free, democratic and dynamic, but it was also the time of the dangers of red-brown revenges and nationalist passions running amok. A very large part of those dreams, or the dreams of those days, have indeed come true. But many of the dangers are also still there. And the world, of course, has changed rather profoundly since then. The collapse of the Soviet Union took us into a unipolar world, dominated by American power and American confidence. Nothing seemed to be beyond the reach and the ambition of the United States at that time. Our economies were booming. Globalization lifted hundreds of millions of people around the world out of poverty. Science and technology broke new barriers. Open societies and open economies were gaining ground year by year, continent by continent. But then it gradually changed. For me, what I'm fond of calling the new age of disorder took its beginning more than a decade ago in 2008. China made a spectacular entry on the global stage with the opening ceremony of the Olympics in Beijing. But literally at the same time, Russia invaded Georgia and subsequently tried to break up the country. And only weeks later, the crash of Lehman Brothers in New York took us into the global financial crisis with ramifications that are still with us. Since then, much is indeed different. The integrating force of globalization has been substantially dented by the disruptive rise of geopolitics. And the politics of identity has often replaced the politics of ideology in our democratic societies. We see a world dominated by the power place of multipolarity rather than the principles of multilateralism. The United States has survived Donald Trump, but not without damage that we still see being played out and where burning issues are still open. The European Union has survived Brexit, but not without damage both to the Union and to the United Kingdom, which now itself is under question. And NATO will hopefully survive Afghanistan out of area has suddenly gone out of business. This is one reality, the fracturing of the global order, the rise of global disorder. But there's another one, the rise of global challenges that can only be met by working together. The pandemic as we've seen it so far is the success of science and the failure of politics. The virus was sequenced within days of it first being detected in faraway Wuhan in China. And within months, there were remarkable breakthroughs in creating vaccines. That was by no means something that could be taken for granted. But politics stumbled for months before waking up. More in some places, less in some others. And when it woke up, it often sought the answer in nationalism of different sorts. There were exceptions, EU after a while being one of them, but trade barriers, vaccine nationalism, and short-sighted policies continues to slow down the necessary common response. We are now 18 months into the pandemic. More than five billion doses have been administered around the world, but nearly three quarters of all of these doses have been administered in just 10 countries. And nearly 40% of all have been done in just one country. The aim that is spelled out by the WHO is now to have 70% of the global population vaccinated by next summer. Whether that will be enough to really bring the pandemic under control remains to be seen. At the moment, we are probably starting to approach roughly 25%. And if you look at the figures for the last week in the WHO European region, which includes Russia, 
There were more than 12,000 deaths reported, and that's a substantial underreporting of the figures. It is a fundamental truth that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Until then, we have perhaps to live through the entire Greek alphabet, variants covered by the entire Greek alphabet. We started with the alpha variant. We are now with the delta variant. It's not the end. The road to omega could bring very painful surprises. It's been, as I said, a success of science and a failure of politics. And that must be repaired before a coming possible pandemic hits us. Many millions have lost their lives. Many more, unfortunately, will. But still, we have probably been lucky. Some of you might remember the SARS in 2003. That was the first of coronavirus of our times. It was significantly more danger, deadly than today's coronavirus. Roughly the same, otherwise but significantly less contagious. But if we tomorrow see the emergence of a coronavirus that is as deadly as it was in 2003, and as contagious as Delta is today, it will be nothing less than a civilization-shattering experience. We must come together, all, everyone, of, irrespectively of everything else to build defenses against that very real possibility. And then, of course, there is climate change, more slowly moving, but speeding up. I used to say that it is warming in the Arctic twice as fast as elsewhere. That's no longer true. The latest IPCC reports say that it's now happening three times as fast in the Arctic as elsewhere. The polar ice is shrinking gradually. This summer it's been raining on the ice cap, the polar cap of Greenland. And we will all be affected. The world must move to net zero emissions and do that in just a couple of decades. It's a gigantic undertaking, ending a couple of centuries of addiction to fossil fuel. Just a figure. At the moment, the average global carbon price is around $3 per ton. To go to net zero emissions, that should be brought to around $75 per ton. That's not going to be easy for some of the gas bustling or coal burning big economies, to put it very mildly, or others. Strange as it sounds, Countries around the world still spend roughly $5 trillion a year subsidizing fossil fuels. That will have to be done. Easier said than done. Just one other example. I saw the two or three days ago, the CEO of Speerbank in Russia, uh, Gaman Graf, he was in Vladivostok. He said that the disposable income of Russians will decline by 14% during the next 15 years as the world moves towards carbon neutrality, these things have political effect. But the bottom line is, of course, that all of this can only be done if we work very closely together, all irrespective of everything else. So we are thus in a situation where we see rising tensions that have made working together more difficult than it was in the past, a revisionist Russia, an assertive China, uh, not always entirely predictable United States, but at the same time a situation which working together on issues of common survival has become nothing less than imperative. And to balance this in the years ahead will be supremely difficult for politicians everywhere, but absolutely essential. For a long time, of course, our focus in terms of geopolitics was primarily on this, our end, of the huge Eurasian landmass. Building a broader and stronger European Union, 
embedded in an Atlantic relationship with the US and Canada, bringing stability to the Balkans through a policy of EU enlargement, helping reform and transformation in our East through the EU Eastern Partnership and its structures of integration, trying to engage also Russia in a partnership of modernization. And much has indeed been achieved, but undoubtedly the pace of progress has slowed down and in some cases obviously been reversed. The EU has held together, but is struggling to find its place in a world of multipolarity. The enlargement process in the Balkans has lost both speed and credibility with the risk of new tensions building up. The Eastern Partnership is de facto split in two, and with Russia, there is in these days neither partnership nor modernization. But at the same time, it was always clear that this, even if it all had been successful, was never going to be enough. And this is even more clear today. There's an unstable southern neighborhood with, just as a remarkable fact, Estonia and Sweden among the countries seeing its special forces fighting in faraway Sahel at the southern edge of the Sahara Desert. And Afghanistan, which has been extensively discussed here, isn't really a faraway place of which we know little. What happens there impacts directly on South Asia as well as on Central Asia. It is part of a dangerous zone of instability stretching from the Nile to the Indus. There might be those who believe that we can just wind up the drawbridge, send out the occasional drone, and they will all be safe and happy forever thereafter. But I think history should have taught us that there are no moats wide enough to isolate us if chaos, despair, and conflict spread in these areas not too far from us. And neither can these issues be insulated from wider issues of strategic competition and credibility. A strategic competition certainly has its focal points or centers of gravity, but it's placed, played out across the board with no areas entirely off the board and no issue completely without relevance. The tremors from the retreat from Afghanistan will shake us for a long time. There are many lessons to be learned. The name of the immediate game must be damage limitation. It's about credibility of forever commitments, of strategic patience. It's about the cohesion of alliances and partnerships, also under stress. There's much to be done, by Washington primarily, but also by us. Our strategic adversaries will not rest in their efforts. If they see us as weak, divided, and confused, the risk of them seeking to exploit opportunities they perceive will obviously increase. They might not have a long-term plan at all, but short-term temptations might be too difficult to resist. We have seen that before. And there are dangers in this situation that I think are more immediate. The next few weeks, we'll see a massive concentration of military power in the immediate vicinity of where we are. Maneuvers are just maneuvers, legitimate and necessary, and need not necessarily be more than that. But with the madman in Minsk, in the middle of these maneuvers, we have every reason to be on our guard. Desperate dictators are dangerous creatures. Not only we, by the reason, have reason to be under guard. So, I believe, has the Kremlin. The tail wants to wag the dog. There are no limits to what he might do and what might happen. And then, of course, Russia is always there. The most populous of European countries, 11 time zones, a hundred times the size of Estonia in terms of population. Lennart Meri for obvious reasons, spend time contemplating the future of Russia, where he involuntarily has spent a large part of his life. Saying in one of his final speeches that, I quote, 
we have underestimated the immense historical inertia of Russia and warned that, quote, the notion that neighbors are dangerous, which is long dead in Europe, lives in Russia, end quote. But nothing is necessarily forever. In the same speech, he um, wanted to highlight that, quote, the history of Russia is a history filled with periods of perestroika, which have been as dramatic as the spring tours on the large rivers of Siberia. Clearly, that is not where we are today, at least not in political terms. In the end, it is autumn approaching winter in Russia. Lieutenant Mary said that the country would need two generations to recover from totalitarianism and get rid of that painful burden of history. Let's hope and let's wait. But at the moment, President Putin is more busy with rewriting the history of his country than shaping its future. It is regrettable, but it's a Russia that is looking more backwards than forwards, increasingly living with the dangerous illusion that it can recreate some sort of greater Russia. So far, it has managed to lose the friendship of Ukraine. With due respect to Crimea and to the Donbass, that must, in a wider historical perspective, be seen as a strategic setback of the very first order. And the long-term geopolitical orientation of Russia isn't clear. Whether it again, as during its earliest centuries, will be dominated by a strong Asian power remains to be seen. It is by no means preordained, but if it really permanently loses its anchor in Europe, this might well be what it will have to reluctantly or not accept. And further away, of course, China is building its middle kingdom and expects the surrounding powers to kneel down and pay their respects. There are fears that it over time has the ambition to take over the world. But even if its rise will continue, if reforms are again given prominence in its policies, it actually shares with Russia the inability to make its neighbors the best of its friends. And thus, true greatness in power will for the foreseeable future be beyond its reach. But what happens on that other end of Eurasia will of course impact what could happen on our end of the same gigantic landmass. A conflict over Taiwan, to mention just one example, could well consume the United States to the extent that Russia suddenly succumbs to temptations here. Playing with fire there could then lead to fire here. And that, of course, brings me to Europe. We see that fundamental questions these days are again up in the air. Can Europe again be a power ready to share responsibility with its allies across the Atlantic, being a better partner, but able also to act alone when necessary in defending its interests? That's clearly not where we are today. And in a world where the ultimate power remains nuclear, the limitations are fairly obvious. But with the United States that might well be forced to look more inwards, as it tries to overcome the divisions and heal the, the wounds in its own society, and with its strategic orientation increasingly focused elsewhere, I think that's simply what we have to do. That will be a long journey. There are numerous problems. The relationships between the European Union and the United Kingdom, to mention just one, will take time to repair. But I believe it is a necessary journey to undertake. So then, finally, what would Leonard Mary have said if he was standing here today? I guess he would have been very worried about the present 
he normally, by the way, was. But I believe that he would at the same time have been confident about the future. He normally was that as well. And perhaps he would have chosen to reflect on the upcoming 300 year anniversary of the birth of Immanuel Kant in that city by the Baltic Sea that has a German past, a Russian present, and hopefully a European future. Then he would probably have said that what Kant wrote in 1795 in his famous philosophical essay on eternal peace remains as valid today as it was then. It's only when all states become, in the words of those days, republics, democracies, and open societies, in the words of today, that we can start to see a forever peace as a true possibility. And we must never lose sight or confidence in that ultimate aim. So these are demanding times, even difficult times, and it's likely to become even more so. Then it's often too good, good to look at the fundamental issues and the long-term trends. That is what Lennart Mary did. That is what gave him his optimism, and that is what made him a transformative politician, and that is what we also must do. Thank you. I don't know what the time is. Card is head of whose time is up. Uh, there are no time for any questions or any objections. So, thank you.